Good morning, beloved community. It is a joy to be with you today and to be back in church. I had a wonderful time in Vermont with my family. For those of you who are with us the first time, I want to welcome you to First Congregational UCC Church of Washington, D.C., an inclusive and justice-seeking church in the nation's capital. My name is Sam McFerrin, and I serve here as the associate minister. We are a community that finds strength from God and from one another. Today is a very special day at the church. It is a day that combines remembering our baptism and our covenant with God and with one another as we baptize Arthur Mills. We're so blessed to have Arthur's family with us, including his grandparents. It is also the sixth year that we have celebrated labor from the pulpit a tradition on Labor Day community where faith communities from the, the bima to the pulpit from across the country answer the call to focus on worker justice, economic justice, and the ethical commitment that if we provide living wages and strong benefits, a retirement plan where we can live our older years in dignity, this is a fundamental tool to help all of us, especially low-wage workers, their families, and their communities. We are grateful for our Andrew Hamilton and our own Lauren McFerrin, who have dedicated their lives to worker justice and who will be our liturgist and scripture reader. Andrew serves the SEIU Union as their director for health policy research. Lauren leads the National Labor Relations Board as their chair. We are most excited to hear the witness and prophetic words of Reverend Wes McNeil. While I will provide a longer introduction of them later, their ministry demonstrates that the high tides of wages and benefits lift families and communities. And their work in the Poor People's Campaign is a reminder that justice work is not to be done in silos. It is one where the intersection of justice, whether that's worker justice, racial justice, economic justice, gender and LGBT justice, children justice, immigration justice, compel us to work in concert and solidarity to answer God's call. A few logistics. We are in phase three of our gathering plan. Every Sunday, we welcome up to 25 people here in the sanctuary with us, and we welcome everyone else via Zoom for hybrid worship. As a reminder for those in the sanctuary, please remain masked and observe distancing and leave the singing to those at home. Helping us with technology, we have Allison Truhar, and, and, uh, who will be our Zoom moderator, and Tom Sowers as our sound designer, and Dr. Karen Bartman as our guest musician. Thank you all for making today's service possible. To follow our order of worship, you can see in the chat room our digital worship folder. And after worship today, we invite you to, to stay a little longer for a really meaningful conversation. It's going to be a guided listening session where the search committee for our next director of music wants to hear from you when we think about the future of our music ministry here at First Church. So now, whether it's reminding us of our baptism, how our baptismal waters speak to our own belovedness, or how West Sermon serves as a shofar to bring about justice and transformational change, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we sing, Here I am, Lord.
Good morning, First Church. As we come together on Labor Sunday, I would pose a question. As a country, why is it that we observe Labor Day? Does Labor Day honor labor, or does it honor labor struggle? Does it valorize skill and dedication in the ordinary performance of people's jobs, or does it call us to take the side of workers who withhold their labor in protest against unjust working conditions? Labor Day as a holiday has its roots in the Gilded Age. Unions were growing and seeking respect for working people, and the first Labor Day parade was held in New York City on September 5, 1882. The organizers of that parade picked that date because it was halfway between the 4th of July and Thanksgiving. To my knowledge, the date did not have any other significance. But there was a rival date that had a tremendous amount of significance to many union people, May 1st or May Day. Union activists focused on this date in honor of the Haymarket martyrs, who were prosecuted unjustly in connection with mass strikes and demonstrations in Chicago in early May of 1886. The choice between these two dates came to a head in 1894 with a nationwide rail strike. That strike, the Pullman strike, was triggered when the Pullman car company cut wages but did not also cut rents for employees in company housing. As the strike spread to multiple states and multiple railroads, the federal government took the side of the railroad barons and President Cleveland sent troops out to break the strike. Eugene Debs was the president of the railway union. And during the strike, he was continuously selling, sending telegrams around the country urging peaceful picketing by the strikers. In doing so, he was defying a federal injunction that barred railway union leaders from communicating with subordinates in support of the strike. He ended up in federal prison for six months. As the dust from that strike settled, Congress passed a law creating a federal holiday on the first Monday of September. This was in part to thwart the popularity of May Day and its promise of workers organizing collectively together against injustice. I mention this history because I think it shows us something important about our country. We have in our tradition both of these threads, honoring work as a regular part of human life and honoring collective struggle by workers demanding justice. These same two threads live side by side in our faith tradition. The book of Proverbs, for example, praises the diligent as those who will be richly supplied. But a very different thread is at the center of the Exodus story, which for me is the foundational story of the entire Bible, and I would suggest is in the background of today's reading from the book of James. In Exodus, Pharaoh has locked the Israelites into jobs where they have no choice but to produce more and more bricks. Their justice does not arrive when the Israelites keep making bricks diligently and find their needs richly supplied. No, justice arrives when the divine liberator takes the side of the oppressed and provides them with leadership and supplies for a collective march out of slavery and into a distant promised land of justice. For me, as a labor activist, who's, I've been in the labor movement for nearly 30 years in one form or another, this is the heart of Labor Sunday and of Labor Justice Sunday the story of God the liberator taking the side of the oppressed. I pray that as we come together this Labor Justice Sunday that we find the voice of this God of liberation. Let us worship together. I would like to invite forward the Goodfellow Mills family, their friend Heather, Reverend Sam, John Smeltzer, as we participate in this morning's baptism. Friends, the ceremony in which we now share is both ancient and timeless. In all parts of the world, from the earliest days, parents have brought their children to a sacred place, sharing their joy with the community and dedicating their children to God. 
Eight days after his birth, Jesus was named and presented in the temple at Jerusalem. Today's baptism is also a time to recognize a new child by name, for it is by name that each one of us is known by God. This is a public occasion shared by parents, family, and a community of friends to remember that we all have a responsibility to care and nurture every child. Our faith reminds us that our children are God's children, entrusted into our care for a season, and it is our task and joy to give them a world more peaceful and just to which to grow. It is our task to learn from them in awe and wonder of life with which all children come into the world. This morning, Christy and Barry bring to us a child, a sign of God's blessing, a gift of hope. Friends, the sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God, inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us, but also to our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the sacrament that ushers our children into the care of Christ's church and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. Water is an essential element of baptism. It is a symbol of cleansing and life in the Bible, the waters of creation, the liberation of Israel through the sea, the waters of Mary's womb, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, the woman at the well, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. To bless this water for baptism, I would like to invite Arthur's brothers, Wallace and Woodrow, to help. Can you come on over here? Oh, I'm so happy to see you both. Do you know that a blessing is when we call down God's power of love and we send it into a person or a thing so that it is filled with God's mercy and grace. So to help me, I want to ask you, stretch out your hand over this water while I say these words. Ready? Here we go. Loving God, pour your love and power into this sparkling water that it might become living water that blesses Arthur today and always. Amen. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Well done. Will you pray with me? Oh God, like a mother who comforts her children, you strengthen us in our solitude. You sustain us and provide for us. We come before you with gratitude for the gift of Arthur, for the joy which has come into this family and for the grace with which you surround them and all of us. As a father who cares for his children, so continually look upon us with compassion and with mercy. Pour out your spirit. Enable us to abound in love through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, blessed is the child who has faithful, loving grandparents. Arthur's grandparents, Carl and Liz Goodfellow, are present with us in the sanctuary this morning. And his grandfather, Barry Mill Sr., I believe is joining us by Zoom. We're so happy to see him. We are grateful to have them here, and I have one question for them. Carl, Liz, and Barry, do you promise with the wisdom of your faith to support, encourage, and love Arthur and his parents and to help him be a faithful member of the Christian community? If so, please answer, we do with the help of God. We do. We do. Help of God. Amen. And similarly, we would like to welcome Heather as, our God, as Arthur's godparent. A Jewish proverb says that in the time of travail, go to the friend of your father, go to the friend of your mother. From this ancient wisdom comes the practice of naming godparents special people who dedicate themselves to caring for the welfare of a child. Christy and Barry have invited Heather Petch to serve as godmother to Arthur. 
Heather, it is a loving tradition into which you are invited today because of your friendship, because of your care and your love for Arthur and your example of a life well lived. Christy and Barry have asked you to become godmother to Arthur. Do you promise to love, to support, and to encourage him to live faithfully into the person that God has created Arthur to be? If so, please answer, I do, with the help of God. Christy and Barry, to you are entrusted the sacred joy, privilege, and responsibility of guiding your child to live in the ways of Jesus, teaching him to recognize his God-given worth. Do you desire to have your child baptized into the Christian faith? If so, please answer, we do. And you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with your child in faith to help Arthur be a faithful member of a Christian community? If so, please answer, we do, with the help of God. We do, with the help of God. Now, Wallace and Woodrow, I have a question for you. Here it is. Do you promise to love Arthur your whole life through? and to bring him to church when you come, and to help him learn to know Jesus? If so, please say, I do. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Today, Arthur's community of faith witnesses the sacrament of his death. And so I ask all of you who are present as the friends and family of Arthur, do you who witness and celebrate this baptism Promise your love, support, and care to him as he lives and grows in Christ. If so, please answer, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. Let us now proclaim our covenant in community. In grateful response to the call of Jesus Christ, we covenant with God and with each other to be a church of Christ. We bind ourselves in God's redeeming presence to walk together in ways revealed to us by the Holy Spirit in sacrament and word, study and prayer, fellowship and mission. Barry and Christy, what name do you give this child? Arthur James Mills. Arthur James Mills. By this name, you people will call you, and in this name, you will be blessed by God. I wonder if I can hold you, sweetie. Hi. Oh, oh my goodness. Arthur James Mills, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all. The Holy Spirit be upon you, child of God, disciple of Christ, and member of the church. Amen. Yeah. Here's your mommy. He finally felt that water. Okay, and now I invite Arthur's grandfather, the Reverend Carl Goodfellow, to offer a blessing. Lord, we bring a special blessing upon this young man. Yes. Like the fabled King Arthur, may he have the heart of a lion, a heart that's filled with compassion that flows like the mighty Niagara River. May you give him the wisdom of a sage and a faith that moves all the mountains that lay before him. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Friends, Beloved community of First Congregational United Church of Christ, let us welcome Arthur, child of God, new sibling in the body of Christ with the song, Little Children, Welcome. Yeah, green.
And now let us celebrate the baptism of Arthur by passing the peace of Christ with one another. And the peace of Christ be with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, peace be with you. That was beautiful. Peace be with you. Peace, everyone. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Good morning. Elisa. Hey, Barbara. Hi, hey, Barbara. Peace. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Peace, Randy. Peace, Lauren. Peace. Oh. Hi, Randy. Oh, hey, hey, Lisa. <laughs> Peace, everybody. I miss everyone. Hey, <laughs> we miss you. <laughs> Peace, Nan and Nick. Peace. Peace. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> extended peace. Oh, she must be. No, she's on Zoom. She is. She's so popular. So glad. <laughs> For those that are at home, there is a lot of joyful celebrating here in the sanctuary, and I wish you could see it. Um, well, now let us prepare our hearts and minds as we prepare for the word with the centering music.
Today's scripture reading is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. My siblings, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please. While to the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved siblings, has God not chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom promised to those who love God? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point, has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my siblings, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a sibling is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I, by my works, will show you my faith. The word of God. Amen. It is a great privilege to introduce to you today our preacher. Reverend Wes McNeil serves as the Executive Director of Labor and Religion of New York State. This coalition unites faith, labor, and community leaders in a statewide movement for social, racial, and economic justice grounded in our deeply held moral and democratic values. They also serve as the tri-chair of New York State Poor People's Campaign and National Call for, Memor for Moral Revival. West is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and holds an MDiv from Union Theological Seminary in New York City, where they were a fellow with the Kairos Center. Prior to joining the Labor Religion Coalition in 2014, West was a parish minister in Tacoma, Washington, they have a BA in journalism from Ithaca College. Although I have not met West in person, I declare West a friend. West's partner, Emily Otto, has been a friend of mine during my, since my early days of ministry. Emily followed me as an intern at the Church of the Pilgrims here in Washington, D.C. There, we were both mentored by the late Reverend Jeff Craybill, who I know is smiling from above, so grateful that this service is happening and grateful for our continued friendship. Finally, the joy of baptizing Arthur also provides me with an opportunity to celebrate that West and Emily have a beautiful baby boy named Benjamin, who is almost six months old, and we celebrate their early ventures into parenthood. 
So as we baptize Arthur, we also celebrate Benjamin and all of our young children today. So with that, I want us all to provide a warm and heartfelt First Church welcome to Reverend Wes McNeil to provide today's message. Good morning. Morning. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and for the invitation to be here this morning. It really is a blessing to get to celebrate Labor Day with you all and for this opportunity to do so virtually. Um, as Sam mentioned, I'm a new parent of an almost uh, six month old. So we're uh, distancing as much as we can, as I'm sure many of you are doing to protect vulnerable folks in our communities. This scripture lesson this morning uh, brings to the forefront our Christian duty to be agents of change in an economically unjust world. And in my work that Reverend Sam just describes, this is a topic uh, that I engage with throughout our network in New York State and a topic that the Poor People's Campaign addresses in our work in more than 40 states. Uh, and so if you'd like to learn more about those efforts, I encourage you to check out the websites laborreligion.org and poorpeoplescampaign.org and see ways that you can get involved. But let's start first with this scripture reading. Chapter two begins with James reprimanding this early Christian community for showing favoritism for the rich. And in particular, he has noticed that people wearing nice, expensive looking clothes are treated better than poor folks wearing dirty clothes. In my Bible, the title of verses 1 through 13 is warning against partiality. Really, though, James is making two points. One is warning the community not to show favoritism and partiality to one another. But his other point is to remind the early Christians that in fact, they are supposed to be partial when it comes to the rich and the poor. James is clear that God's side is the side of the poor. Throughout his letter, James calls attention to the clash between the ways of the world and the ways of God, which, is ex which ex expresses itself in the clash between the rich and the poor. In verse five, he says, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that God has promised to those who love God? Later on in this book, in chapter five, James has extremely harsh words for the rich. Chapter five, verse one begins, come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. So James is clearly not discouraging the early Christians from taking sides between the rich and the poor. His warning is against showing favoritism to the rich in particular. And he argues that doing so betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of both the community's actual relationship to the rich and the meaning of their faith. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? James is saying that the rich both oppressed the early Christians materially by taking them to court, for example, and they blaspheme the name of Jesus. And on the flip side, James reminds the community that not only does their faith call them to take the side of the poor, their material circumstances also put them on the side of the poor. The Roman Empire was a period of extreme economic inequality and concentration of wealth at the top, like our own time. So chances are the people in fine clothes in the midst of this congregation were not truly the rich. They were actually much closer in circumstance to the folks wearing dirty clothes than they were to those at the top of the Roman hierarchy. And so James urges them to treat one another accordingly, to refrain from showing favoritism or judging one another. I would argue that in many cases, the church today suffers from much of the same confusion that James is writing about. First of all, even liberal or progressive churches too often prevaricate about the very clear biblical message that God is on the side of the poor. 
in my experience, there's a common misconception among Christians that our faith should make us wary of taking sides, as if the commandment to love our enemies actually means denying that we have any. But as Howard Zinn famously said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. And James is making a similar point. Neutrality is not an option. Unless we intentionally choose the way of Jesus, we will fall into the opposing way of the world. Unless we take the side of the poor, we will default to the side of the rich. Perhaps part of our hesitancy to take a clear stand also has to do with our confusion about who are the rich and who are the poor. In general, Americans tend to have a distorted view of how wealth is distributed in the United States. We underestimate just how few people control the majority of it. According to a 2019 study, the 400 wealthiest Americans controlled 60% of the nation's wealth. Put another way, the 400 richest Americans have more wealth than the bottom 150 million. Even people who most of us would consider quite wealthy are actually much closer to the poor than the super rich. Take this example. A person that earns a million dollars a year makes 69 times more than someone working full-time at the federal minimum wage. That's a big difference. But the $31 billion that Bill Gates made in the first year of the pandemic is 31,000 times more than that $1 million. This inequality has only worsened throughout the pandemic. If we were to consider James's question, is it not the rich that oppress you? The answer could hardly be more clear to us than it is now. Looking back to those first few weeks in March and April, 2020, we might have imagined that COVID-19 would usher in a kind of rebalancing of the economy. Public services we had disinvested in for decades were revealed to be critically important. The kind of work we often devalued if not disdained, was shown to be essential. We were coming to a new recognition of our interconnectedness. We all remember the applause and cheers that filled the streets of cities at 7 p.m. shift change for hospital workers. While most of us were on lockdown, we wanted to encourage and show our gratitude for the workers who were literally risking their lives to care for the sick. And it wasn't just healthcare workers. The category essential workers included all kinds of workers that didn't have the social prestige of doctors and nurses. Delivery drivers, grocery store workers, bus drivers, farm workers, sanitation workers, fast food workers. For at least a moment in time, the public had a deeper understanding of how much our society depends on their labor to function at the most basic level. But when it came time to put this newfound appreciation into practical terms, the praise that had come from many politicians and corporations proved hollow. Earlier this year, Congress once again failed to raise the minimum wage, even as it was clear that essential workers disproportionately earned low wages. The pandemic has led not to a rebalancing of the economy, but to an almost unimaginable worsening of the imbalance we started off with. Not only have the wealthiest corporations and individuals not experienced the same financial hardship as the rest of us, they have actually profited from the crisis hand over fist. For example, Jeff Bezos's wealth increased by $99 billion between March 2020 and this July. The wealth of Google co-founders, Sergey Brin and Larry Page more than doubled to over $100 billion each. All this while tens of millions of Americans lost jobs, income, health insurance. Goldman Sachs released an estimate just this past week that 750,000 households face eviction if the moratorium struck down by the Supreme Court is not extended. Since the start of the pandemic, my friend Mark has been organizing these massive drive-through food distributions every week in the Albany, New York area through the Area Labor Federation and Catholic Charities. The demand is enormous 
They run out of food every time, usually with 20 to 30 cars still waiting in line. Mark told me about one interaction he had with a woman who told him she had lost her job. She had been applying for any job she could find open, but even though she had a master's degree, no one was calling her back. Mark told her to get a service industry job, you have to take the master's degree off your resume. But I worked so hard for it, she said, with tears in her eyes. There are so many people like this woman who at one time seemed to be solidly middle class, yet during this pandemic have been pushed into the ranks of the poor. And in reality, this is a trend that has been going on for some time. When the Poor People's Campaign did a study in 2018 of who is actually struggling to make ends meet in the US, we found that it's 140 million people, or 44% of the population. And many more people are one healthcare crisis or job loss away from poverty. A 2013 study found that 80% of American adults will experience a year or more of economic insecurity at some point. To take the side of the poor, therefore, is actually to take the side of the vast majority of us. When we seek to orient society around those who Jesus calls the least of these, we aren't just helping a small or marginal segment of our community. Society as a whole is better off. As we say in the Poor People's Campaign, when you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. Having a clearer understanding of how wealth is distributed helps us to understand why and how policies that lift up the poor and working class serve the common good. But beyond that, when we better understand just how many of us are poor and just how few of us are rich, we also gain a clearer perspective on our connection to one another. Is it not the rich that oppress you, James asks? Our affirmative answer to that question unites us with literally billions of people on this planet. As the director of the Labor Religion Coalition, I'm sometimes asked what labor and religion have in common. I respond that the simplest answer is solidarity. The idea that we're all siblings, that our fates are connected, that an injury to one is an injury to all. Though we may express it differently, the principle of solidarity is foundational both to every major religion and to the labor movement. And at our best, both religion and labor understand solidarity as transcending the bounds of our own immediate communities or institutions. General Baker, a prominent labor activist and organizer from Detroit who passed away in 2014, said this about the labor movement. Clearly the union movement is only the organized part of the labor movement. The labor movement is all of those who work by the sweat of their brow, whether you sell mental or physical labor, whether you work in the countryside or in the city, whether you are paid by the hour at all or all at once, whether you work part-time or half-time or not at all. If you once used to work and are no longer able, if you once used to work and now are unemployed, if you wanted to work and can't get there, all of this represents the strength of the labor movement. Solidarity is more than just an idea or a belief. Solidarity is also about strategy. As General Baker says, the vast breadth of the labor movement is the strength of the labor movement. Recognizing that nearly half of the US population is poor shows the power of the poor in this country. The history the history of the labor movement and other movements for social change show that it is only when masses of people come together that oppressive structures and policies are changed. Recognizing our inseparable connection to one another is the key to unlocking this collective power that lies dormant when we remain divided. This is important because as James says in verses 14 to 16, what good is it, my siblings, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet do you do not supply their bodily needs, 
What is the good of that? Taking the side of the poor intellectually or emotionally is meaningless unless we're taking action that actually changes the conditions of the poor. And that is why as followers of Jesus, we're compelled to not just preach solidarity, but to practice it. The good news is that all around us, the broader labor movement is taking up the struggle for justice. The thousands of striking coal miners in Alabama, striking Nabisco workers in the West are on the front lines of the labor movement. The water protectors organizing to stop the construction of line three in Minnesota are on the front lines of the labor movement. Tenants organizing all across the country to win an eviction moratorium and rent cancellation are on the front lines of the labor movement. We're surrounded by opportunities to join in the sacred work and to proclaim our faith through the practice of solidarity. Show me your faith apart from your works and I by my works will show you my faith, James writes. May our works, especially in these trying times, show boldly and clearly our faith in Jesus Christ who came to bring good news to the poor. Amen.
Yale University um, for providing that. For the offering, I want to lift up that in 2 Corinthians, we are told that all things become new. As this summer has come to close, all of our hearts are weary and heavy, whether it is the Delta variant and the surge in COVID, whether it is a tragedy emerging in real time in front of us in Afghanistan, the, de the increased destruction caused by climate change, heartless legislation passed in various states. There is a lot of brokenness in the world, yet our faith tells us that all things become new. So how can we find the new from all this brokenness? How can we find hope and remind ourselves that there is light that the darkness will not overcome? Well, it begins with faith, faith in a God who will never abandon us. And it begins, as Reverend West said, in solidarity and through community. By being a community that cares genuinely for one another, that shows support for one another, and cares deeply about loving our neighbor. Here at First Church, we demonstrate that in many ways, through the drop-in center for homeless and dislocated youth, through our journey on how to become a more anti-racist congregation, through the compassion that we show in calling and caring for one another, through the peaks and valleys of life, through sharing our faith and our stories with our children and our youth, helping them strengthen their faith and learn out how to live their faith. Very excited about these upcoming outdoor child-friendly services that we'll have the first one in two weeks. And through it all, we just keep on keeping on, having love lead our way and having and knowing that we are never alone. It is here at First Church that God has graced us to be together as a faith community. And it is through this message that I invite you for today's offering. The easiest way to support the church is to go to our website, firstuccdc.org, and then you can support the church through PayPal or Venco. Or if you're fortunate enough to be with us today here in the sanctuary, the offering plate will be uh, in the narthex upon your departure. We thank you so much for not only your, so your support, but all that you do to make this faith community so special. Amen. I am going to share with you those prayer requests that have come into me, then we will go to God in prayer together. Prayers of mercy for June King, the twin sister of our beloved Joan. June's husband, Ray, is not doing well after a recent release from the hospital into assisted living. As you can imagine, it's a very stressful time uh, for June right now, so please let us keep her family and her in our prayers. Friends, prayers of comfort for Priscilla Waters as she grieves the loss of her sister, Pat, who passed away peacefully on Friday. Priscilla is this morning driving her grandnephews up to Detroit to get them settled for a new year of school. Please keep her in your prayers. Prayers of comfort for the Marsh family following the death last week of Nora and John's uncle William. Nora reports that he was a wonderful and gentle man dedicated to his community and church where he lived for over 50 years in West Newberry, Vermont. Prayers of provision and mercy for all whose lives have been upended by Hurricane Ida, including Jean Alexander's daughter Elizabeth, who lost everything when her apartment flooded. We pray also for Darby, the college roommate of Antonio Rodriguez, whose home was washed away by Hurricane Ida. His father was killed while rescuing his mother. And so we lift up his family in your prayers uh, in, in this time of grief. Barbara Gerlach asks for prayers for women in Texas prohibited from getting an abortion and for a Supreme Court that failed to provide equal protection under the law and for all those working for reproductive justice. Please let us 
pray for Reverend Sam's mother, who underwent surgery just over a week ago, prayers for her continued recovery. Karen Pence asks for prayers of comfort for the family of Devin McKeever, a childhood friend of Brian's who died this week. And we continue to pray for Lance and Liz Warren amidst health challenges Lance is facing, gratitude that their daughter Marlise can be with them this week. Let us pray. Merciful God, we give thanks for all who labor for the common good, especially those whose labor is unappreciated but essential. We thank you for farm workers who pick the produce we eat, for all who labor in medical settings despite the burnout, for the teachers who show up for our children day in and day out, for public servants who bring communities through the disasters wrought by climate change, for low-wage workers who struggle to make ends meet, and for all laboring to birth a more just and loving world for the generation to come. Restore the weary, O oh God. Lift up the downtrodden. Remind us of our sacred calling and bless our labor that it might not be in vain. May your glory fall over all that we sow that we might bear the good fruit of your spirit until your kingdom is made real among us, until heaven and earth are one and only that which is done in love remains. God, as the sweltering summer heat fades into fall, we ask that you would lift the burdens on so many hearts. For those who've lost loved ones, homes, belongings, everything in Hurricane Ida, grant your mercy. May we come together to provide. For Afghan families arriving in our city, grant your everlasting peace and make of us faithful neighbors. For the grieving, Lord, may your healing be a balm for their wounds. Even in this broken world, O oh God, we thank you for our children who insist on play and laughter. We thank you for the beauty of music and the refreshing breeze that enlivens us. We thank you that in all people and in everything, there dwells the living Christ, the one with calloused hands and a tender heart, who taught us to pray using words like these. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, We Are One in the spirit.
You may be seated. Before Reverend West offers our final blessing, a few brief announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today, please take a moment to complete our visitor's information form. If you're online, that link can be found in the worship folder. A reminder that we have open signups for anyone wishing to worship with us in the sanctuary. So please do take a moment to sign up for the Sundays you wish to worship in person. Next week, we will celebrate Communion Sunday. And later in the afternoon, I invite you to join us for a Zoom gathering of remembrance in honor of the life of our beloved Joan King. That will take place at 3 o'clock next Sunday by Zoom. And following worship today, please stay on this call for a nurture on meaningful music brought to us by the Director of Music Ministry Search Committee. For those of you worshiping here with us, you can join that conversation by finding a quiet space and connecting through your own device, or you're welcome to join me up in the chapel where I will be using my laptop to connect. And now for our final blessing from the Reverend West McNeil. It has been such an honor and a blessing to be with you all this morning. I'm going from this place renewed and my soul inspired. So thank you. And I leave you with these words. May we go forth from this time of worship, encouraged by the signs of new life around us, by new babies, the laughter of children, and the turning of the seasons. May we go forth inspired by the struggles for justice that have come before us, the struggles for justice that we see around us. May we go forth empowered by our realization of our connection to one another in this community across our country and around the world. And may we go forth recommitted to the difficult and beautiful and sacred work of solidarity. Amen. <laughs>